We are pleased to have with us Ellen Weeb, Jewel Breeze, and Puneet Luthra. Dr. Ellen Weeb is a clinical professor in the Department of Family Practice at the University of British Columbia. After 30 years of full service family practice, she now res uh, restricts her practice to women's health and assisted death. She is the medical director of Willow Women's Clinic in Vancouver and provides medical and surgical abortions and contra contraception. She developed Hemlock Aid to provide consultations for doctors and patients about aid in dying, and she provides assisted death. Jewel Breeze is a nurturing partner to her husband who was diagnosed with dementia in 2018. She supports his right to choose made when his quality of life, as he defines it, becomes painfully compromised and his window for capacity of giving informed consent is narrowing. She is a strong advocate for advanced requests for made. She believes in the importance of access to emotional and spiritual nurturing for those who have chosen made, as well as for their nurturing, nurturing partners. Jewel is also a volunteer facilitator for Elder College, uh, Vancouver Island University. And finally, we have Puneet Luthra with us today. He is the Director of Government and Stakeholder Relations at Dying with Dignity Canada. He is a government relations professional with 15 years of experience in the charitable and nonprofit sector. He holds a master's degree in public administration and a bachelor's degree in political science. So welcome to all three of our speakers and our uh, fantastic audience. I will now turn it over to my colleague, Nicole. Thanks, Kelsey, and thank you all for being here, our speakers and our audience. Um, so today we're obviously uh, meeting to talk about Alzheimer's and dementia and end of life options. So I just wanna start with a few statistics um, to set the stage here. So worldwide, uh, dementia affects more than 50 million people, um, a number that is supposed to increase to almost 131 million by 2050. And in Canada, more than 402,000 seniors, so folks 65 years or, and older, are living with dementia. Um, about two thirds of those living with dementia in Canada are women um, and 76,000 Canadians are diagnosed every year. However, Alzheimer's and dementia affect more than just those uh, who experience it. One in five Canadians care or cared for someone living with dementia. And the, the diseases play heavily in the minds of Canadians. Um, back in 2017, a survey uh, reported that 56% of Canadians are concerned about being affected by Alzheimer's. So that's why we're here today talking about the future of Alzheimer's and end-of-life care in Canada. Um, I will stop sharing this now so that everyone can see us. And uh, we're gonna get started today um, with a Q&A with uh, Puneet and Dr. Ellen Weeb. So Ellen, can you get us started and um, tell us right off the bat if a, per a person with dementia diagnosis can access medical assistance in dying? Certainly can. And uh, this has been an important thing for me to um, uh, help with. So let me just give you background on my work. Uh, over the last five and a half years, uh, I have assessed 664 people for assisted dying, and I provided for 370. And as you probably know from all the other information you've received, most of these people have cancer. But um, I have provided for 15 people who have dementia, and I have one scheduled very soon. And uh, I've assessed 24 for medical assistance to dying. So you can see that that's a very small percentage of the total that we care for. And because I do a lot of the complex assessments, uh, I am naturally being referred dementia patients uh, ahead of some of the other physicians and nurse practitioners who do these assessments. Um, and Alzheimer's is the most common form of dementia, and seven of the 15 had Alzheimer's, and the others had the varying other types of dementia that people are diagnosed with. Thank you for sharing your, your numbers. I think that sets a clear picture for everyone and gives them an understanding of things. And you actually answered my second question, which was, have you provided need for a person with dementia? And so we know that a yes. Um, so then I guess let's turn it over to talking about um, MAID and capacity. Um, 
how did the capacity requirements change with the passing of Bill C-7? And how do you determine capacity for a person with dementia? So for my patients with Alzheimer's, uh, the new law did not really change anything, except that it does give some people um, more of a feeling of, of confidence. So for example, uh, right now I have a patient who uh, is planning her death at the end of October. Uh, she has Alzheimer's and I have signed a waiver of consent, waiver of final consent with her. Um, but I explained to her, as I have explained to the others, that uh, what happens in the process of Alzheimer's disease is that people lose their ability to understand their own condition before they lose uh, other forms of, of uh, function. And so it doesn't work to say, I'll sign uh, a waiver and then uh, wait till I'm unable to recognize my family. But there's not a chance that you would be um, uh, able to, to do that because of the way Alzheimer's progresses. So she and I have signed waivers and it's basically the same as for other people who uh, qualify for medical assistance and dying. The waiver is meant for when you lose your capacity and you want to have provision before a certain date. Now, theoretically, you could find a provider who would say, yes, on uh, October 1st of um, uh, 2017, uh, sorry, of, of um uh, 2027 or 37 or 47, um, I will provide made and, and before that if you uh, lose capacity. But in fact, there's, there's no providers in Canada who will do that. Most of us are, are giving a limit of about three months and some about six months. And so it's basically the Audrey Parker amendment. Audrey Parker was the woman with brain metastases who wanted to have Christmas with her family, but couldn't because she was in danger of losing capacity. And, and so she died in October instead of um, January. And that's what we use. So I'm certainly signing these with dementia patients, but I'm signing them basically in case they have a stroke rather than in case their Alzheimer's gets worse. Right. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for sharing that. That, you know, that clarifies things. We get a lot of questions about the waiver of final consent. So um, it's good. And I know we talked about it at our last webinar, but it's nice to hear the experience directly from you and what you're doing with patients and obviously specific to, to this area. Um, and one question that we get a lot of the time, and Ellen, this one is for, for you as well. And then Pruni, I do have a question for you, but um, can a person in early stage of a dementia diagnosis request to access made um, for when they reach uh, later in the stage of the disease. So I get diagnosed, yes. I come to so, you early on. Right, so there are dementias for which this would happen. So for example, uh, Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease is uh, an extremely, that's mad cow disease, is an extremely rapid um, uh, progression. So that uh, once you're diagnosed, um, you probably got six months to live. Uh, and the progression is, is shockingly fast. It can be even faster. So for somebody like that, um, there'd be no problem for us signing a, a three-month waiver and, uh, and going ahead. And also just the process of Kurtzfeld-Jakob and what it does to your brain, uh, uh, it means that it, it, it's, it takes away speech and, and other things before it takes away some of your consciousness of, of who you are. Uh, unlike Alzheimer's, which takes away that sense of who you are before it takes away uh, the other functions. And so, yes, I, it, I, I mean, the only person with that condition that I assisted with before um, uh, was before uh, this year. So it, it, I, I didn't have a chance to sign a waiver with her, but um, uh, I could, but
but not Alzheimer's. I mean, Alzheimer's um, prognosis is, you know, three to 10 years, depending on your age and physical condition and so on from the time of diagnosis. So uh, I can't do it for that. Thank you. Okay, let's shift gears a second. Uh, and Puneet, this is one of our, uh, let's bring you in. This is one of our most asked questions. And I think we've answered it before, but we really wanna make it clear. Um, can someone include in their advanced directive that they would like made should they receive a dementia or Alzheimer's diagnosis? Uh, thanks, Nicole. Yeah, that is a question that we receive quite often. And so my answer to that would be that the, what you include, what one includes in their advanced directive, including an advanced care plan, which you can get through Dying with Dignity Canada, um, is really up to the individual. In terms of requesting that may be provided in the event that they get uh, a diagnosis of dementia in that plan, they can include it. However, it's not a legal option in Canada at this point. So uh, one cannot uh, legally uh, request uh, access to MAID uh, within uh, the current law. So uh, I hope that's clear. Uh, it, advanced requests are currently not the law in Canada. They will be studied in another format, the parliamentary review. Um, but they're currently not uh, legal in Canada. Thank you, Puni. And actually, you mentioned the parliamentary review, and that kind of leads into my next question. So we know that, you, like you just said, advanced directives are being considered in the parliamentary review. Um, can you speak to, for those who don't know, what the parliamentary review is and what we might expect to come from it, um, specifically regarding advanced directives? Or sorry, yeah. advanced requests advanced request. Sure. Yeah. And I think everyone knows that when it, it, one of the confusing things about the whole topic around advanced requests is the language that we use. So uh, I, I, you will hear me always use the term advanced request for MAID. Uh, and I'll try to stick to that even when I answer these questions. But uh, the parliamentary review uh, was uh, mandated in Bill C-7. As we all know, Bill C-7 was part, uh, was passed in March, uh, actually St. Patrick's Day of this year. Um, and then the uh, joint committee to uh, essentially run the parliamentary review of made legislation uh, in Canada, that was struck in, uh, in June. Uh, so a few months after passage of Bill C-7, the joint committee uh, did uh, begin its work and the first few meetings, I think they only ended up having three meetings, but the first few meetings were focused on sort of the state of made in Canada in terms of the sort of hard numbers. So number of deaths attributed to made or by made and just other stats around that. Um, and so the parliamentary review in addition to that uh, is to take a look at five main issues. So they include advanced requests for MAID, uh, the issue of access to MAID by mature minors and by people whose sole condition is a mental illness, the state of palliative care in Canada, and the protection of people with disabilities. When it comes to the discussion of advanced requests for MAID, what we will see is probably a certain block of time held by the committee to uh, study uh, each of those issues. But so when it comes to advanced requests, what can we expect? Well, possibly a call out from the committee to hear from experts around advanced requests. And as a stakeholder in the process, we will be sure to submit names to the committee that of people that they are going to want to hear from uh, when it comes to advanced requests for MAID. Um, there will be an opportunity, I think, for people to uh, prepare and submit their own thoughts, individuals who have thoughts about advanced requests. And I know that there's a lot of people out there watching right now who have family members going through uh, a diagnosis of dementia. And, you know, uh, to be honest, even fearful for themselves. If it runs in the family, they have a, a very strong opinion about advanced requests. And that's something that, uh, you know, the, the committee may want to hear from. Uh, and so we can expect a lot of discussion around that. And you can expect Dying with Dignity Canada to 
uh, continue its message that you know advance requests um, uh, should be uh, law. Eighty over eighty percent of Canadians believe that they should be allowed, and even the government's own consultations uh, showed that eighty percent of Canadians want advance requests. So uh, I hope I answered that question around uh, the parliamentary review. Yes, you did. Thank you. And um, so more to come on that. Um, we'll see what happens uh, with the parliamentary review. And of course, Dying with, Dignity, Dying with Dignity Canada will be following it closely and posting uh, on social media and sending out emails. So if you're not on our email list, you can join and we'll be providing updates. So thanks, Puneet. Um, okay, Ellen, my next question was going to be about um, advanced consent and the waiver and getting into it more, but I think you really highlighted it well for us. Um, a few questions back. So um, I do have an audience question that I want to uh, tie in here. So someone wants to know, um, what about consent when someone has early dementia? So for example, they're forgetful, but fully oriented. Um, how does that play? How do we do it? Yes, uh, very important. So um, the, the uh, consent is um, uh, the similar to how we do consent for other medical procedures. You do not need to know what day of the week it is. You don't need to know who the prime minister is. What you need to know is that you have a medical condition that's causing you suffering that you have choices between uh, an assisted death and a natural death, that you're able to reason about those choices and uh, that you um, choose a medically assisted death. So what, um, I'll, I, I mean, sometimes uh, you, you talk about early dementia, early dementia, um, people know they've got Alzheimer's, they know they don't like Alzheimer's, they know that um, they often tell me stories like I had a neighbor who had it and my mother had it and I saw this and I don't want to go there. And so they're able to explain what, uh, how they made their decision, like how their, what their thinking processes are, even if they can't remember the name Alzheimer's they can remember that they've got something that's interfering with their brain function and will get worse. And so, for example, I had one patient who had frontal temporal dementia and I asked her what condition she had. And she said, uh, uh, because she couldn't get the words out and she couldn't remember the name. And I said, is it frontal temporal dementia? And she said, yes, 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 that's the one. Um, uh, so, you know, we don't need a really, really high level of cognition. We need those specific understandings. Do they really understand that they have a serious condition that is getting worse, that, um, that they want to end their life early um, rather than wait for the disease to take its full process? Thank you. And um, just to clarify, we have a few more questions coming in. Ellen, maybe you can just speak to this a little bit. Um, you know, Alzheimer's aside, we're getting some questions about the waiver of final consent. And that can, that's, maybe you can just clarify for folks again, because that's not specific for those with an Alzheimer's diagnosis. It can oh, be no. used, but. And we are using yeah. it much more often for people like Audrey Parker. So we're talking about people who have cancer who uh, they know they're at serious risk for a stroke, uh, for sepsis, a, you know, overwhelming infection, things that would take their um, cognition away, their ability to uh, make, uh, to give us consent for MAID. Uh, and uh, even people who are in, in severe pain who really need more medication, but medication makes them sleepy and, and difficult to uh, communicate. And so these are the people that we're using the waivers for. Um, I have signed uh, quite a few made waivers. I don't know the exact number, but I've only used one once. And this was a man who had liver disease and he set his date. He knew he wasn't going to go right to the end of this disease and um, you know but he was it was a bit weak and he was a bit um, nauseated and, and so on as people are with liver disease and uh, the day before he's, he had his date he was found unconscious on the floor and so 
he um, was brought to hospital. His um, uh, support team uh, knew all about the waiver and we went ahead and provided at that point because he could have lived for quite a while and uh, that we knew that that's not, not what he wanted. So that's, that's the times that we're using waivers of final consent. And, uh, and this, the stories I've heard from my colleagues, uh, that's when we're using waivers. It's when people lose consciousness or lose their ability to communicate due to the drugs they have to take to manage symptoms. Uh, and so it's wonderful because it means that in the past, you know, we had people who would say, would refuse their pain meds because they were so afraid of losing capacity. And so they would go through too much pain. But now it's not an issue. You know, you take whatever you need because we've got a waiver signed. And so, but in fact, I haven't had to use it in, in those particular people uh, in the last six months, but it gave them such peace to, course, yeah. yes. So those waivers have been absolutely wonderful and um, less, less useful for dementia than for cancer and, and right. the other conditions. Right. Yeah. And we are getting um, a couple questions um, that are, there's a little confusion around um, the waiver and an advanced request. Um, so I don't know if you want to speak to that a little, Puneet, feel free to jump in on that one as well. Um, they are, they are different things. So maybe Ellen, you can start and Puneet, if you have anything to add. So the waiver is an agreement between the provider and the patient. It says that I will provide made on a particular date for you and uh, that if you lose capacity before that date, then I can provide before. And that's it. So you have to be assessed and approved for MAID before we do it and by two um, clinicians. So we can't do it like an advanced request when you're still healthy. <laughs> Yeah, right. that's, that's, that's the main thing. Sorry, Puneet, go ahead. And I would just add that the the criteria, as I understand them, is that uh, the waiver is for those who have whose death has been assessed as being reasonably foreseeable. So uh, that would be something that would you know divide people into whether or not they can use that or take advantage of the waiver or not. Uh, the criteria does say. Uh, that the, the waiver is for people whose death is, is reasonably foreseeable. Thank you both. Okay, so I was mixing in a few audience questions there, but let's um, finish off, uh, Puneet. One last question for you, and then I'm going to see if we have a couple more minutes for some audience questions. But um, can you speak to the election results uh, and what this means for MAID in Canada moving forward? Yeah, so the election is now uh, over. We have essentially uh, the same uh, government as we had prior to parliament being dissolved to elect a new government. Uh, and so uh, what does that mean for made legislation in Canada? Well, uh, as a nonpartisan organization, we're, you know, we're looking forward to working with all the parties. Uh, uh, but the one thing that I think we can agree on that would make us optimistic is that uh, Bill C-7 was passed by essentially the same liberal minority government. Uh, and for that reason, I think there's reason to be optimistic that uh, they see the value in, in uh, reinitiating the parliamentary review as soon as possible and getting that joint committee named as soon as possible. And that's our message to the government. But I think, uh, uh, I think it's, you know, essentially the same group of, uh, it's the same uh, group of people that are returning to Ottawa. So I don't see too much um, opposition to getting that review, get back on track. In terms of timing, it may not be as quick as we want it, but our message is it has to be as quick as possible. Thanks, Puneet. Okay, we have a couple minutes um, now before we get into Jules' half of the of the webinar here. So I do have a couple questions in the chat that I want to ask. Um, 
We have a question, uh, Ellen, I'm gonna direct this one at you and Puneet, this is one where you can feel free to chime in as well because I think it, it kind of hits both, uh, both of you here. So um, how do we balance clinicians workload, mental health, burnout with the public's desire for advanced requests uh, they, there are likely few clinicians who will be willing to provide for confused um, and perhaps resistant dementia patients uh, for very long, if ever. So, uh, Ellen, I'll let you start. Uh, yes, uh, and I'm one of them. Uh, I, you know, have, as I said at the beginning, provided for lots of people and believe this is one of the most rewarding, best or a part of my work in the last 45 years. But um, the idea of providing it for somebody who uh, can't tell me or didn't tell me in a re re recently that this is what they wanted, uh, uh, it doesn't sit well with me. Uh, I cannot imagine performing what seems like um, euthanasia for an animal um, it just doesn't make sense. I, but you know, I, I, I'm, I'm moving, I'm changing. Uh, I had no difficulty with the one patient that I had who was um, uh, in, uh, you know, hepatic encephalopathy at the end. Uh, but, uh, you know, this was only one day early. Uh, so, it was it was easy, and we know this. We we've done a study that um, is to be published shortly, uh, asking providers in what situations would they be willing to provide, and uh, the there were providers who said more than than um, me, uh, who said that they would provide in a situation where all they had was the advanced request. Um, if, if it was legal, of course. And so there will be some, but there will be a lot less. And I, I can tell you that we're already in a similar situation right now with the track two patients. So people whose natural death are not reasonably foreseeable. Um, at a meeting this week with providers, uh, one of them who runs one of the um, uh, made uh, centers said that he had 30 hospital providers and 60 uh, community providers in his area. And five of them, five were willing to provide for people whose natural death was not reasonably foreseeable. So we're already into this problem and it will um, exacerbate when, if we get uh, advanced requests. Yeah, wow. Puneet, anything to add on that? Not to put you on the spot. Yeah, no, I, I don't have anything to add. I, you know, Ellen, as a physician for so long, understands the, <laughs> the clinical context and the, you know, the relationship aspect uh, with their patients. So um, I would defer to a, a physician who has more experience with that stuff. Okay. Than that, so. Okay, thank you. I'm going to ask one last question um, here. Everyone, thank you for submitting all your questions. I'm seeing them. Um, you know, we're a little short for time, but if you want to email support at dyingwithdignity.ca, um, we can follow up with you individually, even if it's a general question, you know, I'm happy to uh, forward them on to whoever they need to be sent to to get you some answers. So again, it's support at dyingwithdignity.ca. Uh, maybe Samantha can throw that in the chat uh, for us for anyone who needs to um, to follow up with us directly. Um, so last question, and then we're going to move on. Um, where is it? Let me find it. Uh, it's for Ellen, and I think we slightly touched on this, but let's clarify because this is a common one we get. Um, can someone qualify for MAID at an initial diagnosis of dementia, even if it's only mild and there are no other comorbidities? Yes, um, there are all of the dementias that um, I mentioned, you know, vascular, or maybe I didn't, um, Alzheimer's, vascular dementia, uh, frontotemporal temporal dementia, Huntington's, um, Lewy body dementia, Kreutzfeldt Jakob, they're all fatal conditions. So they can um, all uh, be considered um, that your natural death is reasonably foreseeable and predictable based on the, the diagnosis. 
And when we call somebody mild in terms of Alzheimer's, uh, they've already lost a lot of function. So when we are uh, doing our assessment, in addition to natural death being reasonably foreseeable uh, in, in that uh, sense, we have to have um, them qualify under advanced state of decline in capability. And uh, so quite often the Alzheimer's specialists would call somebody mild, but um, the patient would tell me, I, I can't manage work anymore because I can't multitask and I can't keep track of things. And I have lists and lists and, and, and I, I still can't, can't manage. I can't do my banking anymore. I've given it to my daughter because I'm making mistakes. And, uh, and, and she'll, she'll go through this and she'll say, you know, I have trouble with conversations. I can't keep a conversation going properly. Um, uh, people talk around me and, and I, I used to be involved, but I'm not anymore because I, I can't, can't manage. So this person would tell me that she was advanced and I would agree because from where she was to start with to now is advanced. An Alzheimer's specialist would say, oh, that's mild because she can still walk and talk and uh, eat and um, uh, she can use the toilet and uh, all of those things making her mild. Well, that's not what she said. And, uh, you know, I agree with her. Yeah, yeah, that, that really clarifies things. And that's a question that we get a lot. So um, it's great to hear it directly from you because you are doing the hands on work. Um, so at this point, I just want to really thank both of you, Puni and Ellen, for answering all of our questions and to the audience for submitting all of your questions. And again, we will follow up with you individually. But now we are going to shift gears a little bit and we are going to talk to uh, Jewel. So Jewel, thank you for, for coming and being here today. Um, I'll give you the floor uh, for a quick second uh, while I uh, get your slides ready here. Thank you, Nicole. I just want to say I, I, how grateful I am to have this opportunity to be a presenter. And also, I want to say a big thank you to uh, Dying with Dignity Canada for all the webinars that they've put out in the last, in, in, in the last several months. I'm, I'm thinking particularly of the one of the grief series. I found it really, really valuable. And before um, I answer any of your questions, there's yeah. something that I would like to, to share with, with everyone. It's, uh, I would like to read a verse from an anthology from the world's sacred poetry and prose. And this is a Native American tradition. It's called Great Life Giving Spirit. And this is just the first verse. And, I, and for me, um, it's been really helpful. Uh, great spirit of love, come to me with the power of the North. Make me courageous when the cold winds of life fall upon me. Give me strength and endurance for everything that is harsh, everything that hurts, everything that makes me squint. Make me move through life, ready to take what comes from the North. That's so beautiful. Thank you for sharing that. I really appreciate it. And again, thank you for being here. So um, we have some questions for you. So let's get started. Um, can you tell us uh, about uh, your husband, Wayne, and when he received his diagnosis, um, how the conversation around mate began. Yes, um, Wayne received his diagnosis, it's his official diagnosis of Alzheimer's back in January 19th, actually, 2018. And it wasn't surprising to hear him say, I'd like to look at the possibility of mate, because over the course of our relationship, which now is 52 years, um, when there was a, a friend who, or um, a, a friend or a relative who uh, had a terminal diagnosis, we would have conversations about um, quality of life and as opposed to quantity of life. And we always seem to come on the side of it's the quality of life that really counts. So I hope that answers the question that you're asking. Yeah, and I mean, it's even great just to highlight that you had those conversations together. Um, and that's so important. And that's, you know, that's why we do a lot of work around advanced care planning, because those conversations are 
are really important. So thank you for sharing that. Um, can you tell us now what, what MADE means to you and what it means to Wayne? Well, for me, um, MADE means the opportunity of having a choice, a choice for end of, end of life care, so to speak. And um, I think everybody should have that choice. And I'm looking more at the idea of dying a death with dignity. And this is what, uh, for me, is really, really important. Uh, and the sense of control. I would say that my husband would quite possibly agree with me. Uh, I don't want to put words in his mouth, but he would take it one step further and say the fact that he knew that he had the option for me and uh, made a big difference in uh, the fact that he felt he had a sense of control. And that was so important. And that um, eliminated so much stress that he was under. Absolutely. So uh, let's shift gears for a sec here. So your book that you wrote, The Hot Chocolate and Decadent Cake Society, Alzheimer's and the Choice for Made, is a memoir in poetry and prose that offers snapshots of your first year living, uh, following your husband's Alzheimer's diagnosis. Uh, it strongly advocates his right to choose made when quality of life as he defines it becomes uh, painfully compromised. So um, how would you feel about sharing excerpts um, from your book with us now? And I will pull up a photo of it. Okay, thank you. No, I, I appreciate the opportunity. I'd like to preface this by saying that um, there is a healing power in being able to tell our stories. And for me, this memoir has opened up a pathway towards my own personal healing. And that's going to be, you know, continuing this journey of healing. The format of the book itself uh, is a little po a, a piece of prose on the top part of the page. Uh, and it's complemented with a three line poem. And this three line poem tries to capture the essence of what was expressed in the prose. And I would uh, also read a little bit from that now. January, 2018, an appointment at the Brain Health Center in Vancouver confirms our suspicions. The hope that brain research pursued with this center might create a way to move forward rapidly dissolves. Although anticipated, Alzheimer's diagnosis still so surreal. Come back in a year, a referral will be sent to a geriatric psychiatrist to discuss the possibility of medication. We strongly advise that you ensure your affairs are in order while you are still able to do so. Well, thank you for your advice. Medication, however, is not an option we choose to consider. Cast off and adrift, Alzheimer's solution a lifeline of hope. And Alzheimer's Solution refers to the book, Alzheimer's Solution by Dean and Ashea Shiraz. Um, we found it very helpful. When my husband shares his dementia diagnosis, we hear, how can I help? Or call me when you need something. Responses are usually prefaced by, oh, so very sorry to hear about that. These are heartfelt, and appreciate it. There are also those who for reasons of their own distance themselves. Compassion in friends touches the soul. March, 2018, the Alzheimer's Society series, Shaping the Journey of Dementia does not meet our needs. My husband introduces himself saying, I have been recently diagnosed with Alzheimer's when my quality of life deteriorates and before I am no longer being capable of giving informed consent, I want the choice of made. Uncomfortable silence, hanging response, not a choice for dementia. Courageously lobbied, pioneers in a league of their own, right of choice, Bill C-14. The message from our family physician, lawyer, and Alzheimer's Society suggests that dementia does not fit the criteria for MAID. The tourniquet of unbearable stress resulting from hearing this message tightens. Despair and depression, soulmates conceived when hope seems lost. 
April 2018, a community forum on MAID held in Parksville the evening of April the 19th provided information on the legal, medical, and spiritual aspects of MAID. Dr. David Robinson, MAID lead for Vancouver Island Health, spoke on the medical perspective. His presentation would unknowingly offer a pathway to hope. Relevant information, a beacon of light providing direction. A call to Dr. Robinson's office put us in contact with Roseanne Bethune, MAID Intake Nurse co Coordinator for Vancouver Island Health. Roseanne compassionately reform, informs us that those with dementia may meet the criteria for MAID as long as they are deemed competent of giving informed consent. She then asks, asks do you need a contact number for a doctor on our MAID team? Thank you so very much. We already have the name of a doctor who we would like to contact. Stress talons released, hope regained, a sense of hope reunited, a sense of control regained. May 2018 to October 2018, we have a compassionate phone conversation with a doctor whose office we contacted. A consultation appointment is booked to discuss my husband's decision to explore MAID. An angel of compassion, how welcoming, comforting, and reassuring. The consultation of, is the first of many appointments scheduled at four month intervals with both our doctor and a geriatric psychiatrist. He continues to access, uh, assess my husband's mental capacity to give informed consent in order to advise when a window of doing so appears to be narrowing. A member of his outreach team also comes to make home visits to help. Disease progression, narrowing the window of consent creates disease. Our support team is a blessing and a gift. How comforting to feel cared for and know we are not alone on our journey. Concerns and questions are always addressed. Feeling compassionately listened to is so affirming. Time patiently allotted for reassurance, the gift of compassion. The choice of MAID is an option given my husband a renewed sense of control over his life. The overwhelming burden of stress slowly lifts. Embracing life, revisiting memories, and the freedom to plan his final day enhance my husband's right to do it his way. Dissipated stress channels energy into present moment living. Emotional and spiritual support is needed by those who have chosen made and by those who through this choice will lose or have lost a loved one. Such support might be addressed through the hot chocolate and decadent cake society. Imagine a nurturing environment where tears, laughter, hugs, hot chocolate and even decadent cake are all part of the healing. Imagine too, this idea spreading with the hot chocolate and decadent cake society springing up all over Vancouver Island and perhaps beyond. Alone, we could do so little. Together, we can do so much. Helen Keller. The slide that you see there was an opportunity given to me to highlight or to, to showcase this little book. For that, I am so very grateful. And it also offered, off, offered the opportunity to um, have conversations with like-minded people. Thanks, Joel. Thanks for sharing that uh, excerpt from your book. Um, it's so nice to get just a taste of what your experience has been like with Wayne. And um, we really appreciate you sharing that with us today. Um, you. So you mentioned your, yeah, you mentioned your compassionate support program. Um, so we know that you have that um, uh, and you facilitate that. So can you share an overview of this program and tell us what inspired you to create it? Yes, I'd love to do that. The Compassionate Support Program that, that I uh, worked at has uh, four components and each one is two hour sessions. And it's offered basically for uh, eight participants. Nice to keep it small. So there's that, that feeling of comfort, of trust 
and the ability to reach out and share. Uh, and so it, it consists of sharing uh, and uh, small group sharing, personal reflection, and also relevant activities that nurture compassionate support. Societies like the Alzheimer Society of BC offer a lot of uh, excellent resources and educational programs, but sadly, the urgent need for a compassionate support program offered through the Alzheimer Society of BC for those who have chosen MAID or are considering this choice and for their nurturing companions unfortunately still needs to be addressed. My program is an attempt to bridge this gap. And uh, those of you in the audience who are interested in building upon it, uh, I'd love you to keep get in touch with me. It's not mine, it's there to share. Uh, we need to make it better and make it available. Uh, it, it's so important. And I would also like to uh, bring your attention to uh, a uh, to bridge for you founded by Signe Novak and I just became aware of it through a friend bridge for you is a peer driven non profit society that offers support to people going through a medically assisted death with a loved one. Uh, it's a sister organization to bridge C 14 and I think it parallels in some way um, in trying to address the gap that I've been talking about. Okay, we can go through the uh, Perfect. program. So again, this is an overview. Celebrating the positives in each day. Every day may not be good, but there is something good in every day. And I've chosen to read them for those of you that maybe can't see the slides as clearly. Um, personal perspectives overview. It's the healing power of telling one story. And a story is a promise of a conversation. Alzheimer's impacts us emotionally, physically, mentally, spiritually, intellectually, and it impacts our life's interests. We also have categories of grief and giving ourselves permission to mourn. Again, perspective, personal perspectives. We have nurturing. How do we nurture our physical, emotional, social, mental, intellectual, spiritual, and life interests. And we look at enhancing our brain health. We know how important that is and how much is available for us to, to uh, research, or not research, but to read. And then we can take a look at defining quality of life because quality of life is individual for everyone. And what might compromise quality of life? And how dementia might influence choice for MAID? And I'd like to say that again, this is a choice, it's a personal choice. And maybe something that just as a friend of mine, I, I think many of you know and heard of, uh, of Ron Posno would say, it's for the doers and the users, okay? And sometimes um, everything else gets clouded. And then we can look at the societal perspectives. And one of those, again, what are the support systems? And I just use the hot chocolate deck and a cake society. You might be curious as to how I got that number, that, <clears throat> excuse me, that, <clears throat> that title. Well, if any of you have, listened, have, have heard uh, or watched the uh, Guernsey Literary Society and, hot pota and, and uh, potato peel pie, all of a sudden I'm thinking I'm trying to get a a, 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 a title for this book and that came to mind my husband loves hot chocolate and he loves uh, decadent cake actually lemon cake and it just seemed wow that's lighthearted. let's use that and many people think it's a cookbook okay so again with societal perspectives lots on current brain research Alzheimer's Society Canada has got an awful lot with that with the brain exchange, so much there. And then B Bill C7, um, dementia and access to me. Programs like you're doing, webinars to um, uh, create a greater awareness. And then advocacy, uh, means of advocating for advanced requests and, and the idea of highlighting informational websites, okay, are all part of uh, this this program. 
And this is just a two-day workshop seminar that my husband and I wanted to do. Uh, it ran over, it was four sessions and uh, it, it was four workshops done over two days. And it was, uh, I guess we could say that COVID got in the way, all right? And so it's still on the back burner. And something that I did learn is that you need to have a means of advertising. And if you had Alzheimer's Society BC on board that they could at least in their, in their uh, first link say that there's a program available. They don't have to support it, but to say there, there is something available if you want to choose, you know, look at it and investigate. Because again, um, by yourself, as Helen Keller said, you need uh, everybody working at this. And then, as Helen Keller would say, the only way to the other side is through. And what I'm hoping for is that, again, there'll be some of you that might be interested in and help to work and make this better. What have I missed? Yeah, thanks, Jewel. That was great. It's great to get an overview. Um, I know you're just scratching the surface today and letting folks know uh, what, what your program is all about. So, um, Folks can reach out to you if they have more questions. They can contact us at support at dyingwithdignity.ca. And we are happy to, uh, to pass any questions about the program or the book along to Jewel. Um, Jewel, can you just uh, highlight where folks can find your book uh, if they want to read it? Well, um, the only way you can get it is through me because uh, I just take orders and then I go to Printorium in Victoria and then I get copies printed. Uh, and uh, one of the things that I did at the beginning is that the book itself was $15 and $5 of every uh, of that was going to, uh, to support Dying with Dignity Canada. And that, uh, and that can still happen. So it's, it's um, and it's such a small little book. It's a great conversation piece. You can carry it in your well, maybe not your back pocket, but uh, yeah. back or something. And uh, who knows when uh, you want to start a conversation over coffee or hot chocolate with someone. Yeah. Oh, that's wonderful. Thank you. Okay. So um, we talked about your program and your book uh, and writing, yeah, you know, your memoir and creating this compassionate support program you just shared has helped uh, you to begin the process that is opening the door to healing uh, and the song that you recently wrote and recorded called finally I named you is also a part of your healing journey um, so would you like to introduce that to us now I will get that set up while you uh, give a little background on that uh, yes um, the song I finally named you uh, is another as, as Nicole said is another way of um, healing for me I often write songs for my workshops you know um, and they're because they're more personal. And the nice thing is you can't be compared with anybody else, right? You write your tune, you say it, and, and there, there it is. But um, this song refers to dementia as being the mammoth in my mind, all right? And uh, coming to terms with this mammoth because we always talk about the elephant in the room. Well, that elephant's bigger than, I think a dem uh, the mammoth is uh, perhaps I like, I like the, the symbol of the, of the mammoth. Okay. Yeah, folks will see that. So um, thank you, Jewel. Thanks for being here. And I just want to thank everyone who came out today uh, to watch and ask questions. And to Dr. Ellen Weeb and Puneet, thank you for coming and answering our questions. And we will now um, close out with uh, Jewel's song called Finally I Named You. Finally I Named You is a song about Alzheimer's and how it once was the mammoth in my mind. Tusks scrape my mind, scrape across my mind, so cruel, so unkind, these tusks scraping my mind. Finally I named you, no longer do you hide. Alzheimer's cruelly robs, it does so from the start. Knowing how you suffer, tears at my heart. 
Fear of losing capacity unsettles you, unsettles you. In the driver's seat, despair found relief. The moment that you knew made was a choice for you. Bill C7 now needs amending to, amending to. I am here beside you, adding my voice. Support for advance requests by making them a choice. Advance requests need a voice. Make them a choice. Make them a choice. My courageous friend, until you choose to go, we will walk together. Later tears can flow. Later my tears can flow. Finally I named you. Now I know you. No longer do you hide. Beautiful. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Joel. Have a great afternoon. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.